Hello students of world history. Today is still unit one, but it's part four of our unit, talking today about river valley civilizations in India and China. Is As far as India is concerned, we have the Indus River Valley. This is the Indus River here on the map. Um, the Indus River flows from basically the Himalaya, the range of, of mountains known as, known as the Himalayan mountains up here, flows down into the Arabian Sea. And this is where we have the, um, the Indus River Valley civilization or the Harappan uh, civilization happening. There are some environmental uh, challenges to living on uh, in this Indus River Valley. Like Mesopotamia, it has uh, the river floods. It floods unpredictably. That's a problem. It catches uh, the people of, of the um, Indus River Valley off guard sometimes, floods their villages, floods their fields, and so on, and it's definitely a bad thing. Of course, the good thing always is that uh, the flooding is bringing silt or it's bringing rich soil. That's always good. Um, Another thing that, that uh, India has, or the Indus River Valley, is uh, something called the monsoon. It is a um, prevailing winds and a prevailing kind of weather that happens at different parts of the year. And it has cycles of very wet weather where it rains an incredible amount. And then there are uh, periods of time with extremely dry weather. And uh, if it's not too wet or too dry, then things that work, work out quite nicely. However, if it is, you know, it has drenching rains, it's going to flood fields. It could even um, cause uh, rivers to change course and so on. And incredibly dry um, weather is also bad for crops, makes things dry up. And there could be, um, you know, famine or, or something like that as a result of that. So this is the monsoon, uh, like I said, winds and, and a special weather pattern that can be bad for uh, the people living in India. Uh, rivers do change their course sometimes. It could have to do with the monsoon. It could have to do, as you'll find out um, here at the end of, of this particular part, with earthquakes uh, changing, uh, changing the course of rivers. The uh, political organization of uh, the Indus River Valley are uh, city-states just like in Mesopotamia, n unlike what we had in Egypt, which was a kingdom or an empire. We really don't know very much about how these uh, Harappan city-states were organized, were led. We assume from uh, the archaeological record that the priests were rulers, but we just don't know, and I'll talk about why we don't know that in just a moment. Uh, the economy was farming. Everyone is farming. Everyone is herding at this point in time. They do have some trade, both on land with people close by, but then also seaborne trade or trade that uh, they're going across bodies of water to trade with people. For example, even in Sumer or Mesopotamia, they got that far. We know that because we find some Indian um, trade goods in Mesopotamia, we find Mesopotamian trade goods also in the Indus River Valley. So that's how we know that. We also know that from bones that we find in these in the, the uh, ruins of these Harappan city-states that they kept chickens and sheep and cattle and goats as animals that they were that they were eating at this point in time. By the way, this is kind of interesting. Chickens are probably the most widely eaten animal across the world today. It's very successful. The chicken, we believe, starts off in India as a kind of jungle bird, a wild jungle bird that people captured and then tamed and then, you know, all the products that we get from chickens nowadays, their meat and their eggs and so on, comes from that. So it starts in India, probably. In terms of technology, the Harappan city-states, this Indus River Valley civilization, had buildings made out of brick. Brick is clay that is baked and, uh, and then used to, to build. It's a very good building source. It's harder than the clay, for example, that the Mesopotamians were using, and, and not quite so hard to get a hold of like the stone that the Egyptians were using. Something that's really quite amazing because you don't have this happening until probably the 1800s in different parts of the world, but the Indus River Valley Civilization or the Harappan city-states had sewage systems. They had flush toilets. They had the ability to get water to flow through pipes and through their uh, through their buildings and, and through their homes in order to have, you know, toilets. 
and uh, people are are urinating and defecating and that that waste is being taken away like i say this doesn't happen again for thousands of years really uh, not until the 1800s so it's a pretty remarkable feature of technology that they had another thing that they're doing which is also very modern is planning their cities out on a kind of grid system so that the streets run parallel to each other and then also perpendicular to one another. It's very well, well laid out. Usually cities and towns and villages are throughout history really kind of haphazard, just sort of thrown together. They grow up as they grow up. So this is another way in which their, their technology served them well and, and was able to, um, to make a, a fairly modern style city thousands of years ago. Now, the reason we don't know too much about the Harappan city-states and, and the civilization is because although they do have a system of writing, we have found that, they're kind of pictograms, but we have not been able to uh, decipher them. We don't know what these pictograms say. In Mesopotamia with the cuneiform, we're, we're able to read that. In Egypt with the hieroglyphs, we're able to read that as well. But with this Harapan writing, we just don't know what, what these things mean, and we, we can't venture a guess either. So that's why we really don't know, for example, who is in charge or very much about their history. We do know, however, that a group of people called the Aryans uh, migrated into the Indus River Valley. They migrated into what would be modern day India about 1500 BCE or about um, 3,500 years ago. And these Aryan people transform India through cultural diffusion. They bring their culture with them, their culture, their way of, of organizing society, their religious beliefs start to spread among the people who are already living in the Indian subcontinent, this Harappan civilization, for example. One of the ways in which cultural diffusion is, uh, is evidenced is by religion. There are some sacred writings called the Vedas that the Aryans bring with them. We are able later to, to decipher what, what uh, the Vedas uh, are. And so this reveals a lot about their culture. We know, for example, that this is the beginning of the caste system in India. Caste system is how they organize society. We'll talk much more about that when we talk about Hinduism. But know that at this point in time, very early on, there were five different castes or social groups, and they were identified based on occupation from the very highest people to the very lowest people, and it really has a lot to do with what they do for a living. People are, at this point in time, born into their caste, and they are in that caste for life. There isn't social mobility from one caste to another. There isn't really job mobility at this point in time from one job or one occupation to another. And this caste system then sets up very complicated or complex rules about who people could marry, what they could do for a living, where they worked or how they worked, and what their place in society was. People were really locked into that. But just remember, there are a couple of, of different things going on here. One is migration, a fundamental theme of geography, and the other one, of course, is that cultural diffusion piece, that movement of ideas, movement of a kind of government, movement of a kind of uh, social system or religion from one place to another. The end of the Harappan civilization, we're not too sure about once again. It's thought that, and, and we can see that earthquakes occurred towards the end of uh, the Harappan civilization, or the, the part where their cities were abandoned and so on. And so there's a thought that these earthquakes happened, and this causes rivers to shift, maybe causing floods, maybe shifting the course of rivers away from where people had been farming and living. And if uh, a city or a town is on a river and that river moves, you can imagine that the fields are gonna dry up. You're gonna imagine that the people can't live in that town anymore and they're going to abandon it. And that seems to be what happened. So both agriculture and trade was affected because of the shift in the course of the river. Another possibility, and once again, we just don't know because there's no record that we can read, but maybe their soil was depleted. Maybe there was a shift once again in these rivers and, uh, and the silt isn't coming down from the mountains anymore. The soil gets kind of worn out and then people leave that area and go and search for soil that is much richer once again along a riverbank. Not really sure about that, but that's what people think. Moving on to uh, a couple of Chinese river valleys, we have both the Yellow River, this one here, going out into the Yellow Sea, and then we also have the Yangtze River, which is going out into the Yellow Sea or into the East China Sea. 
There are environmental challenges with living in these Chinese river valleys as well. The Yellow River in particular, also called the Huanghe River, is nicknamed China's sorrow. It's China's sorrow because it floods unpredictably and uh, from time to time, obviously that's going to wreck people's uh, fields. It's going to wreck cities that are built along the river. And so hence the name for China Sorrow. However, the reason that it's named the Yellow River really goes back to the reason that people were farming along rivers, which is the, the, the rich silt, which is coming down from uh, higher up in um, on, on the river, and that is flooding and making the fields really quite, uh, really quite productive. So yellow from the rich silt. Now, China at this point in time, or these Chinese river valleys, are somewhat isolated. In other words, they're really not trading very much with outsiders. Later, there will be silk roads and there will be sea, uh, seaborne trade between China and other places, but not so much at this point in time, which is not always great to not be able to trade with outsiders. So relatively isolated, but not so isolated that they're not being invaded. In fact, they are being invaded. Chinese uh, the Chinese civilizations over time keep getting invaded time and time again by people who live to the north of where the Chinese are settled and people who live to the west of where the Chinese settled. And so these invasions plague the Chinese for, for centuries, really, uh, almost for thousands of years. And that's a bit of a problem. I guess there are no uh, no vast rivers or mountain chains that are keeping people from the north and from the west outside of invading China at this point in time. In terms of uh, political organization, it looks a lot more like Egypt, I think, than it does Mesopotamia. China is ruled for hundreds, if not thousands of years by dynasties or families. They rule for a long period of time. They hand down power from one family member to the next. They tend to be king-like figures. We start to call them emperors pretty quickly because they rule over a number of different territories, a number of different lands. And we have at this point in time the Shang dynasty and the Zhou dynasty. These are two different families controlling the trade uh, that does exist within China, the governmental policies, and the military, really for, for centuries, for hundreds of years. The Zhou, in particular, have an interesting system that we see happening time and time and time again throughout history, something called feudalism, in which the central power, a king or an emperor, gives land that the emperor or king has conquered to landowners or landholders called nobles or lords or the aristocracy. So the, the central power, the, the king or the emperor, gives land to these local lords because the king or the emperor can't control vast territories by themselves. They give this over to local landowners. And those local landowners or lords then rule over the peasants who live in that area. They protect them, they organize them, they govern them, they tax them, and so on. This is really a good system for the most part, unless the lords turn against the central power, they turn against the king, they turn against the emperor, and don't listen to him anymore. That could be a problem with feudalism. But in general, feudalism works pretty well in a system where technology doesn't allow the central government to control the, the territories very well. The Zhou dynasty has some achievements which make it successful. They, could, they build a bunch of roads and canals. The canals are kind of like sea roads or water roads, if you want to think about it. You put a, a boat or a barge on a canal and, uh, and, and pull it from the side of the canal. And, and these roads and canals are great for trade. The, you can load products onto the back of an animal and, uh, and, and, and walk it along these roads, or you can load a lot of trade goods or agricultural goods into a boat or, or a barge and, and uh, float that along the canal. Great for trade in, internally. Another thing that's great for trade that the Zhou dynasty have it has is coined money. Coins uh, are you know just a system of of buying things. You use coins to, to to buy things. If you don't have coins, then what you're doing is trading product for product. You might be trading, for example, rice, a certain amount of rice for a certain number of pots, or um, you know a certain amount of wheat for a certain amount of um, of tools. And it's not very conducive to trade, to trade like this, to trade in kind. It's much better to have money that you can use to actually purchase things. And money doesn't take up quite the, the amount of space that, uh, that bulk products like wheat or other things do.
Another thing that the Zhou Dynasty came up with was blast furnaces for iron production. The very early metals to be used are copper, relatively soft, and then bronze, a little bit harder. But a really great metal is iron, and iron needs high temperatures. Iron ore needs high temperatures to be melted and then turned into something useful like tools or weapons. And blast furnaces are a way of really cranking up the heat so that iron ore can be smelted or melted down. And, cre and create good iron products. So they came up with that and it makes iron production much more efficient. When we talk about Chinese culture, we oftentimes talk about the family and the importance of the family in Chinese culture. The family is a unit that has mutual respect. Let me go back really quickly has mutual respect for one another. A family is very important, but it's always the case that older people are over younger people. I think that's kind of normal. Actually, I think you, you realize that too. And then also at this point in time, men are very important and women are less important. And so with the mutual respect of the family, uh, everyone in the family is supposed to give the greatest amount of respect to elderly men. So the father of a family or the grandfather of a family is going to get the most respect and is going to be, um, you know, accorded the most attention and has the most power. From there, then we have, you know, uh, boys over girls or uh, men over women and so on. But there's supposed to be a lot of mutual respect within the family. At this point in time, the culture or the, the society is, uh, is relatively simple. Once again, you have a, a king or an emperor, and then you have a bunch of warrior nobles or landowners or lords or whatever you want to call them, and they're watching over the peasants. There's got to be some artisans and some uh, merchants uh, or traders in there somewhere, but maybe not enough for us to worry about just yet. In terms of religion, we want to go back to the importance of the family. The family is, uh, has, has a kind of religion that is based partially on the, their family ancestry, people who lived um, years before and, and, and gave birth to the people who are um, currently alive but are now deceased. These uh, deceased family members have to kind of be kept kept happy and uh, and thought of and 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 prayed to and so on to um to provide a, a a good life for the people who are are alive at this point in time in addition to that there are a number of gods this is a polytheistic society as well and there are some priests who are consulting the gods through a kind of interesting way you can see this image over here on the left. This is a turtle shell. It's the underbelly of a turtle, really. And what priests would do in order to communicate with the gods to try to figure things out, what was going to happen and so on, is they would write some words on the, the tortoise or turtle shell, and then they would superheat something made out of metal and place the superheated metal on this uh, turtle or tortoise shell and the metal would cause the shell to crack and where the cracks went through these different words it would tell the people what word the god was trying to say to them and so uh, this is called these are called oracle bones very interesting kind of way of communicating with the spiritual world or um, with the with the world of gods the writing that you find on here is Chinese character writing, it goes way, way back. There is a system of writing. We do know what, what the system of writing says. And what's really quite fascinating about the Chinese way of writing is that the written language is different from the spoken language. And you can have several different kinds of Chinese languages that are spoken, but everyone who is speaking a different kind of Chinese language, when they're reading these characters, they're getting the same message. It's a little bit difficult to understand. Think of this. If, uh, if, if you saw the number four, you would say in English, four. If a, if a person who spoke Spanish saw that very same thing, you, you would both be looking at that. You'd both understand what that is. And, uh, but a person who speaks Spanish would say cuatro, or the person who speaks German would say fear, but everyone understands the meaning of that. So that's kind of what these characters are like. The characters have a meaning, even though the, the, the word, uh, when it's spoken in, in the Chinese, different Chinese languages is spoken differently. It's really kind of a, a, a cool thing if you think about it. So that the emperor who might speak one form of Chinese writes a message and then can send it all over to, to different Chinese people who speak other uh, Chinese languages, but 
everybody's reading the same thing. It's really pretty, pretty neat. The, the problem with this is that there are about 1,500 different characters uh, that one would have to memorize. One would have to memorize these characters in, in, in order to read the language or to write the language. So 1,500 for a basic reading and writing with this character-based language, and about 10,000. They have to learn about 10,000 individual separate characters in order to be a scholar or somebody who's really highly educated to be able to serve in the government and, and be a very smart person. So there's advantages and disadvantages to this kind of, uh, of Chinese character-based language. Finally, I want to talk to you about something called the Mandate of Heaven. The Mandate of Heaven belongs to a kind of dynastic cycle. As I said, in China, politically speaking, it's different families or different dynasties that rule from uh, sometimes for hundreds of years. And so a dynasty like the Shang Dynasty will, will rule for several hundred years. And it's uh, the, the Mandate of Heaven is the thought that heaven or fates or the gods or whatever uh, allows a dynasty, allows a family to rule because the fates or heaven or, or the gods or what have you are pleased with them. They're doing a good job. Well, over time, maybe the, uh, the family or the dynasty is not doing such a good job. And so people who, um, who are living uh, under their control might think, well, it seems like they've lost the mandate of heaven. If things are going poorly, if things are going bad, if there's a famine, if they lose a war, if they're invaded, um, if there's peasant rebellions or whatever, then maybe the mandate of heaven is, is gone and it's time for a new dynasty to take over. And this allows people then to rebel and to fight against the people who are in power and take over and then just say, well, you know, the gods and fate wanted us to do that. Once again, this is called the mandate of heaven. This allows the Zhou dynasty to take over for the Shang dynasty, and then the Zhou dynasty is going to be in charge for several hundred years until they experience some, some bad times, and there's going to be another dynasty that's going to be taking over. I hope that uh, I gave you what you needed for your uh, EQs, for your essential questions. If not, you can certainly read a little bit in the textbook, or you can contact me, and I'd be happy to provide you with whatever you need. Have a great day. Thanks.